So hey everyone, uh, thank you for coming in. Um, so the topic that we're trying to address here is optimizing the long test run times using AI ops. So oftentimes as contributors to open source projects, most of us have made pull requests to GitHub repositories. And they tend to get into CI-CD tests, which oftentimes take up so many resources that we cannot possibly run all tests or just have backlog. So to answer all those questions, how do we do that? And where do we come from? Why are we doing this? Uh, we are here uh, to talk more about the optimal stopping point tool. Um, so I would like to introduce uh, my colleague, Hema. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Hema Viradi, and I'm working as a senior data scientist at Red Hat. Uh, both Akanksha and I are part of the Emerging Technologies uh, Data Science team, which is uh, part of the uh, CTO office at Red Hat, and I'm based out of uh, California in the United States. And um, my name is Akanksha Duggal. Uh, I'm also a senior data scientist in the Emerging Technologies group, uh, and I come from Boston. Uh, so. To give you an overview of what we're going to talk about today, uh, so we start with talking about AI for CI, which is the main project, and the optimal stopping point tool is a subset of this project, and I'm going to also go over what is the motivation behind this project, and what's the solution that we've come up with, uh, what all data sources uh, we are using along the process, uh, going over the workflow, presenting insights, and a final demo where we'll walk you through all the steps that we've taken along. So to start introducing this AI ops toolkit called AI for CI, I would like to mention there's a problem that we're trying to address here so that there's a need of automated and AI-driven monitoring when it comes to the testing data. There's tons and tons of open source testing data that is being generated but not collected or put to use. So we see that there's a lack of AI-driven metrics in the open source community health. So that brings us to the opportunity of leveraging these data sets that are being made available by lots of open source communities. Uh, and there's tons of open operations data, for example, uh, TestGrid, Prow, and GitHub have so much data that we could put into use and find out some interesting metrics that could in return benefit uh, the community health. I lost my cursor, guys, sorry. So the solution that we've come up with is uh, coming up with an open source uh, AI toolkit that helps us in collecting and analyzing all the CI-CD data that is being made available. Then as a part of this project, we've also made machine learning uh, models that help resolve various use cases. So one of the use cases that we try to solve here is called time to merge. So every time you make a pull request, oftentimes it takes super long to be reviewed or merged to the main code base. So this particular model is going to make a prediction, which will just put a comment on your PR every time you make it. It's going to make a prediction of how long will it take for your pull request to be merged. Similar to this, uh, the top main topic of this presentation is the optimal stopping point classifier, which will help you understand how long should it ideally take for your test to finish running, and what is an optimal stopping point after which it should be technically safe to just terminate that test or maybe restart it or inspect why it was acting like that and just save up on some resources for it be uh, cloud sources or engineers. These are also your resources that you must want to save for the right set of things. And uh, another uh, ML service that we have here is called the build log classifier. So we all know that there are tons and tons of logs that are being generated in Prow and it's oftentimes difficult to just go through one, one so many logs. Uh, so what we would like to do here is just classify these prow logs uh, on the basis of the type of failure they belong to. And also as a part of this major project, we have KPI and metric dashboards. These are interact interactive dashboards that you could look at and see all the metrics that 
uh, you have so far. And all in all, with this project, the aim is to foster an open AI ops community that helps leverage all these amazing data sources that we have. So as a part of this project, we so far have collected tons of data from uh, various data sources like TestGrid, Prow, GitHub, uh, and we've collected metrics and created KPI dashboards. We have machine learning services that support CICD processes and are also integrated with GitHub projects, and it's super easy to use. And finally, it's also a resource for uh, everybody in the community to utilize. There are templates, notebooks, scripts that anybody can just put to use directly without, it's just for free, <laughs> basically. So to come back on the topic that we're trying to address, I would like to mention why we are doing this. So this is a graph of various tests that were collected from a GitHub repository called CodeQL. So this is the distribution of the run duration of all these tests. So we see that most of the tests that were run, they finished running within the first minute of running. So that makes us believe that technically it shouldn't be taking so long for these tests to finish running. However, when we started to look at the tests failing test specifically, we saw that there are a couple outliers that take up all the resources or take sometimes infinite amount of time to finish running. So wouldn't it be a good idea to just come up with a point after which we know it's probably just hoarding resources or blocked somewhere, it could be an outage or any reason for that matter. So the aim here is to find out the bottlenecks and just point out where it could be going wrong. So the ML solution that we've come up with is that sometimes these tests are taking long and we would like to find an optimal stopping point after which this uh, test is most certain to fail. And hence, in return, we want to just save and allocate our resources in the best fashion. Talking about the data sources, so we all know GitHub is home to a lot of open source projects and a lot of people make contributions on a daily basis to these repositories. So we are collecting our data from GitHub. We've also looked at Prow, which is a Kubernetes based CICD system. Uh, it has a lot of data that is being collected. A lot of checks that run on PRs are oftentimes reported back to Prow, which is also a good place to scrape data from. Then TestGrid, which is uh, also another platform that helps people visualize their CI processes. Uh, a lot of communities, um, even besides Red Hat, are keeping their data on TestGrid, which is easy to visualize, uh, but still we think that we can come up with a better tool, scraping all this data from the back end and coming up with uh, more insightful metrics and KPIs. So now I think I'm going to give it over to Hema. She'll elaborate on the solution approach that we've taken here. Thanks, Akanksha. So now that we have a brief understanding of what the problem is at hand, uh, let's take a look at the approach that we tried to take uh, in order to come and come up with this optimal stopping point model. So first off, as we saw the uh, different data sources that Akanksha went over, the first step is, of course, to start collecting um, these, these kind of data from our uh, CI-CD tests. So the main data source that we are looking at right now is GitHub. And in GitHub, um, you would have noticed that whenever you make a certain PR to your repos, it usually shows a bunch of checks that are happening at the back end part of the review process, and um, for example, you have like pre-commit checks, you have your uh, file linting checks, and, and apart from this, there can be many other checks that happen. And for any PR to get merged, these are like some kind of prerequisites, so a test has to be successful in order for the PR to get merged eventually. And um, all of these are also sort of defined under workflows, which are part of GitHub Actions. So that's how we're getting these kind of uh, data sets from uh, various repositories. So um, as an initial experiment, we uh, look at a particular uh, repository of interest. We see if GitHub Actions have been enabled for that repo. And then we go and look at the different workflows that have been set up for it. 
and uh, we go ahead and just use an API which allows you to extract that particular workflow ID and all the checks uh, within it can also be obtained through that uh, API and that's how we get all those test durations and, and those kind of um, features that we start seeing from that data. So once we have all of this data ready, we start uh, moving on to feature engineering. So in any uh, ML model approach that we look at, uh, you need to start identifying what are those important relevant features that can be used as an input for your model. So here uh, we're gonna look mainly at those test durations where Akanksha showed us the plot of those different durations. And what we try to do here is um, for a given test, we kind of see the entire distribution of how long that test is taking to run. And we further try to bucket them into different uh, time range intervals. So for example, um, zero to 10 seconds, 10 to 20, and all the way up to the completion of the test is where we try to uh, further split and divide um, the test durations. And within each of those intervals, we're trying to find how many tests are likely to fail in those time ranges. And we try to basically calculate those percentage of failures over time. And once we do uh, that kind of approach of calculating those durations and splitting them into those different buckets, what we do is finally try to reach to that um, optimal stopping point prediction. So to do this, as I was talking about um, that percentage of failures that we like to uh, calculate in those time intervals, what we do is we've defined a threshold where here it is 75%. So we say that um, in, in those time ranges, if we see that the threshold of is a uh, percentage of failure is more than 75%, we say that anything beyond that is likely that the test is holding up resources and it's likely to fail. Now, this threshold is just um, a, a default value that we came up with, but again, it's, it's customizable. Uh, we can tweak it as per the needs, depending upon how the workflows and um, checks have been set up. But this is just some initial kind of approach that we uh, sort of started implementing to further define um, what that point in time would look like. And once we have that final sort of um, interval or that time slice at which it's going to have a greater chance of failing, we eventually want to integrate this back to the GitHub Actions. So uh, we would like to use the help of GitHub bots here. So what uh, the bot will eventually do is uh, whenever you have a PR open, the bot is going to sort of run the model at the back end and then the bot is going to leave a comment um, on that PR saying, hey, this test is likely going to fail at this particular timestamp. You should probably uh, stop it so that the rest of the checks do not get affected because of it. And um, it's, it's still a work in progress, but that's ultimately the, the plugin uh, that we would like to enable uh, for these different repositories where you have a lot of checks to be passed and there's like, you know, it's a big PR maybe, uh, and you have a lot of developers who are being put on it to review it, but um, they kind of don't have an idea as to why that certain test is failing and you probably want to move on to the next phase of your review. So eventually that's what the bot leaving a comment is, is trying to overcome and uh, help out with um, identifying that pain point for your developers. And so how does this entire kind of workflow setup look like eventually? Is you have your uh, PRs getting open to a repo we go ahead and have that optimal stopping point running at the back end. So in this graph, what we see here is you'll have all those uh, test duration buckets on the x-axis and on the y-axis is the percentage of failing. So as you see, um, as the, the first range is basically taking zero to 10 seconds and then you'll have all the other uh, uh, ranges beyond that uh, until the test gets completed. And then you see there, um, you know, the percentage of failure. So over time, slowly, uh, the percentage of failure tends to keep spiking and rising. So anything beyond that 70%, we say that, you know, hey, it's gonna uh, eventually fail. Um, or if we set the threshold to like 60, then it's probably going to fail beyond that. Uh, 50, 60% uh, time range. And then if we correlate that back onto the x-axis, you'll actually know uh, that uh, time interval at which it was going to uh, fail. So maybe it was around like one minute, 10 seconds or something like that. Um, so that's kind of how the uh, output is gonna look like. 
And then finally, um, this is what the GitHub Action bot is going to eventually integrate as part of our service. Um, it'll leave a comment saying that, you know, it predicted that for this particular uh, check that is happening, uh, beyond 50 seconds is when you should terminate it, else it's going to hog up your resources. Um, but it, it, we won't stop at this. It's The idea is that we can also allow users to take some actions based on that. So we would like to also have some kind of capability of, um, you know, asking the user like should I go ahead and stop this test or um, giving them some set of actions that they can perhaps take and help part of their uh, CI CD process but um, as a very low hanging fruit we, we basically want to leave some kind of comment uh, to provide more feedback uh, for, for the repositories and for the PRs that are uh, being open in different uh, repositories. And now we can move uh, quickly to a small demo. So in this demo, we're just going to go over uh, kind of like the code and uh, a little bit of um, the workflow that we follow. So I'll give it to Akanksha to start um, with the initial part of it. Awesome. Um, all right. Uh, so just for this demo purposes we've like started to look into this repository called code ql and similar to any of your repositories uh, this also has a couple pull requests uh, if you take a look at any of the open pull requests that we have here we see that there are some checks some haven't completed yet uh, some were completed a couple seconds ago so Things like these uh, oftentimes take a lot of time because there are so many checks and workflows that are being run. If you go to actions, you can see more details about each of these checks and each of the runs that were made, how many were failed, etc. cetera. Uh, so what we aim to do here is to get all of this data in Jupyter Notebooks, uh, which is the home ground for most of the data scientists to start exploring the data and find insights out of them. Uh, so, um, if we start looking at this notebook, uh, the main agenda here is to just scrape and get all the information that we get from the actions tab from GitHub. So after we get that um, information, we just try to put it in a decent format that we can finally use to perform some evaluations. And once we have collected all of this, uh, we try to just put them together into different formats and like classify them by passing and failing tests because it's easier to make a prediction once we know how both data sets look like. And uh, once we have the passing and the failing uh, data frames ready, we try to split them up into train and test data and further move towards the optimal stopping point prediction. Uh, so he was going to go over uh, the approach that we follow to find out the optimal stopping point. So um, once we collected uh, the data in the previous uh, notebook, so just uh, to mention, Jupyter Notebooks are, uh, if you're not familiar with, they are basically an interactive way of writing your Python code. Um, why we call it as a notebook is because it's like, you have everything sort of broken down in a cellular format like this. So this will be like a first cell that you run. Um, and then usually the outputs also get um, printed one after the other, um, depending upon how you write your code. So uh, it's a preferred tool for most data scientists. So uh, if you're not familiar about it, um, you can go um, read more about the project Jupyter. Uh, you'll get to know how this uh, tool ha has been used. So that's kind of how um, this code looks like um, uh, in, in that notebook format. Um, but yeah, moving on uh, to uh, start our analysis, we go ahead and uh, take those uh, CSV files that we saw in the previous um, code, and once we get those two different sets of data, so you have one for all your passing tests, and then you have one for all your uh, failing tests, so we kind of read them uh, separately. And um, we kind of looked at it from two different approaches. The first approach is, was an experimental approach. Uh, we don't use this uh, actively right now, but it was something that we uh, researched a bit um, and did some analysis on top of it. So I won't go too much into detail, but 
the idea in this approach is we try to look at the distribution like a statistical distribution of how the uh, run times look like so you again have your run duration on the x axis we try to see how many tests are within those uh, different buckets that we see here so we have about 20 in the 0 to uh, le less than 3 seconds uh, time range and so on so that's kind of uh, where we try to figure out the distribution uh, pattern of it and we do the same thing for both passing and failing tests. Uh, so statistical distributions, there are some libraries in Python which um, will automatically define the best distribution uh, based on the values that you have. So here it's trying to fit like these different type of uh, distributions for the data set that we have. Um, and then it, it tells you which one is your best type of distribution. And based on those distributions further, we um, try to uh, find out the intersection point um, for your passing distribution and failing distribution. And that intersection point is essentially what we map to as our um, optimal stopping point on the x-axis. So that was approach one, um, but we wanted to move on to a different approach which is more favorable for us, uh, which is based on the probabilities of tests failing rather than just looking at the distribution, but more on uh, from a probability standpoint because ultimately that's what you want to predict. So um, as we were talking about those buckets again here, you see some tests are even going all the way up to like, you know, infinite timestamp, which is not something that you want. You want to uh, get rid of those kind of um, long running tests. So after you understand that distribution, uh, we go ahead and try to uh, plot the percentage of failure. So that's kind of what this ultimate approach that we want to uh, focus on. So uh, we set a threshold of 70. After observing a lot of tests, we came up with that threshold. This is just one test that we're showing this for, but um, over time, you're going to have multiple repositories. You're going to have multiple checks, multiple tests. So each data set is going to look different, but this is, uh, in, in this particular code at least, it's just one test for a one particular repository. So um, that's just something to keep in mind that that threshold may not make sense in some situations, but at least it's some kind of a starting point uh, for us to look at. So um, that's where we can visualize it better. Um, these are just a more, uh, from, a, from a more data scientist perspective, we're trying to normalize the values rather than look at the raw values. We're trying to scale the values and things like that. So uh, these are just some couple of more ways where you can normalize your values and uh, try to do the analysis on top of it. Um, but but yeah, you, you see that the graphs kind of look different uh, just because you've normalized your values a little bit. You see some more uh, sort of uh, intervals here and, and things like that, but um, nothing uh, too drastic of a change. And um, yeah, ultimately we kind of use this uh, threshold values on this and then we try to uh, intersect it on this x-axis and then we find out what uh, time duration or what timestamp does that correspond to and that's the point beyond which um, you should not be letting your test run for, for so long. Uh, so that's the overall um, kind of a goal of this uh, particular code and coming back to our slides. Um, if you want to engage more, if you want to learn more about this, um, you can scan the QR code here. It'll take you to our uh, uh, GitHub uh, repo, so we track all of our work there. Uh, if you have suggestions, feedback, um, open for any uh, contributions, or even just you know opening an issue if you want to learn more about it. Uh, so please go ahead and do that. Uh, and we also have an um, another project called AI for CI, which Akanksha mentioned at the beginning of the talk. So that's a more larger open source initiative, uh, which is a collection of all these models that we're building. So one of them, which we presented today, uh, another model is the time to merge model that some of our colleagues worked on. So in that model, we are basically um, predicting what, does, what is the amount of time that it takes for a certain PR to get merged in a project. And uh, why we, we don't want to give this um, to scare people that, you know, it's going to take so long for a PR to merge. But the motivation for doing this is if you have new contributors for any open source project, they might be hesitant to 
uh, participate and contribute code because they don't really know if that PR is going to be reviewed or not. So for any of those first time contributors, uh, the goal is if, if you're able to predict and tell them, hey, the PR is going to get merged in a couple of days, it gives them maybe more confidence to uh, contribute to your projects. And uh, the second advantage is it can also help you know, uh, community managers to look at their project and say, okay, it's taking a lot of time to review PRs. Do we need to change something? Uh, how do we make it more efficient? Things like that. So that's kind of how we came up with these different ways to um, consolidate these models. So if you want to learn more about that, I would encourage you to look at the AI for CI repo. Uh, and you'll find all of these resources there, like the notebooks, the dashboards we've built, uh, the data sources, and so on. Um, so please go ahead and do that. And these are, again, some more uh, references to all of our repositories. And with that, I would like to stop uh, here. But thank you all for attending. And if you have any questions, we have a couple of minutes to take them. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they probably will buy a lot because we are adding a new unit test. Uh, how much do you actually need uh, to think about your well with your project and how does it scale? Yeah, that's a good question. So just repeating the question again. Um, the question was, how well would this work for a smaller GitHub repository? So if you have a smaller repo, uh, a less mature project, I'm assuming, where you have smaller unit tests, how um, uh, accurate this would be? Is that your question? Yes. Yeah. How much, do you How much data do you need? Um, yeah, so I would say for any machine learning model, uh, the generic answer is more data is better. <laughs> uh, so I don't want to default at that answer, but I would definitely say that um, it might not be fairly accurate, but at least over time, if we keep you know trying and seeing that it's uh, predicting at, at somewhat near accuracy, then uh, it would be a good start. But of course, um, if that particular check or that particular test is also found in other repos, we can also use that as our training data set. So it doesn't have to be coming just for your particular repo, but if it's a test that is very specific to your repo, then maybe the training uh, data sets cannot be as large as expected. Um, but uh, I would say it's definitely generic enough that we can try to find you know, data sets from other repositories, which might have similar checks, and maybe use that to uh, better train the model. So that would be one way to approach it yeah do you want to add to that yeah i think just to add to that i think the more we retrain and the more feedback we get from the repositories and the and more the more number of tests that we run uh, that's the feedback that we look for in any sort of machine learning model so that we know how well the model is predicting and we can probably just retrain it on the new data that is being made available by new PRs and tests being run. So I think that would be useful. Uh, does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes, uh, so repeating the question, it was, um, so if you're taking tests from different repos and using that to train your model, how do you kind of map and figure out which, uh, if the data is accurate, right? Um, so yeah, so some of these checks, like for example, in, in that screenshot you saw, uh, there was a check for file linting, or there was a check for pre-commit check. So those are more generic. So those kind of are standardized to some point, to some extent. So even if you're collecting from different repos, we can have some confidence that these uh, data is going to look similar. But yes, some of the other checks are more customized maybe for a particular repository. So it might not work well uh, for the other. So in those situations, we might have to uh, eliminate those kind of uh, data just so that the model is not training on the wrong thing. So it's kind of like um, an experiment of you know checking which data sets is it able to learn better versus which one it's not. So um, that's something we might have to uh, look at further. Yeah. Yes. So this is, uh, I mean, I guess it's slightly correlated to the, to the larger effort, but uh, with this approach applied for uh, tests where, you know, maybe it's, uh, it's like a false stopping point. You can say, like, oh, this test worked, uh, or it ended very quickly. Like, that's a sign that, um, you know, something's wrong, or, you know, there's sometimes just some of the kernel CI where it will fail three times, no one knows why, and then you run it again, and it succeeds. 
yeah, that's definitely okay. That's definitely a good question. I'm going to repeat it. Uh, please correct me if I understand it wrong. So you mean to ask that uh, now that at this point we are making predictions for long running tests, but what about the shorter running tests that f that finish quickly? Is it even accurate that it finished so early? Right? Is that the question? Sure. Yes, short running tests and false negatives. Uh, that's a good question, but as of now, we are just looking at the long running tests. But that is one of the use cases that we would also like to address. But it's a part of prow logs because if you don't get any information from run duration, the best place to go look for more info is prow, right? Like, where do you go look for your logs, particularly for these tests? Do you have logs that are being generated for these tests? Like, is there a place that you go to? Uh, yeah, I think they're kept in the, the warehouse. Okay. Uh, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of it's a pretty large warehouse. Mm -hmm. like, I mean, I know there's someone that, the, the person in charge is here somewhere. Okay. So, yeah, but for most of the tests, especially for OpenShift repositories, they are linked back to Prow. And oftentimes when they don't get an answer, the engineers who are working on these projects, they go back to Prow, look at the logs, and try to understand why a particular thing was happening in certain ways. And that's where like, we also have like a very initial project that we did on uh, Prow log classifier, which would help you understand why why certain things are happening because it mainly just classifies all these logs into categories as to what category they belong to in terms of failures and passing and what could be the possible reason if they are behaving a certain way. Uh, so that's another use case, but this use case is mainly focused on the long running tests. Go for it. Yeah, thank you for that plug-in, Angela. Also, to add on to that, uh, at this point, it's a work in progress. But what we aim to do here with this initiative is that anybody who wants to use this tool can have a customized uh, file where you can just put in what you want from this tool to do. So starting from what is the threshold that you would like to specify, it could be anywhere between 75 to 95, whichever thing you want. Uh, to specify it. And also, the next step here would be to have a tool that will automatically terminate all these tests. But this is only something that we, we can do if the user or the repository owner lets us do. So this is something that we would want to add to this tool, but uh, definitely something that the owner has to take a call for. So you can specify all these parameters and if once you specify it, the GitHub action will automatically run on the pull, uh, all the incoming pull requests in the future. So that's the plan, but most of the things are still work in progress. Uh, but we were happy to just present whatever we had so far. Looks like we're out of time. I would like to thank you all again for joining us. Please feel free to reach out for questions even later during the conference. Thank you.